Uh, so, can I welcome you all to this session on invasive invertebrates. I'm Sue Walker and I'm the Deputy Chair of Scottish Natural Heritage, which here in Scotland is the government's advisor on natural heritage issues. Uh, so we are a government organisation and we lead on policy in terms of advising Scottish Government, uh, but also we, uh, we administer grant systems to uh, land managers who might be wanting to control invasive non-native species as well. So we have both an operational role and a policy role. Uh, so it's good to see so many of you here and also good to see so many papers in the session because I understand uh, the previous conferences on islands invasives uh, there were rather less uh, in this session than in other parts of the conference so it's really good to see so many of you here but also so many papers. Uh, now you'll be aware that we are very tight on time in terms of the session we have this morning and each of our speakers is given 12 minutes and no more, and they will have a traffic light system in front of them, and when they get to red, then uh, they drag kicking and screaming uh, off the stage here. So I do apologise for that in advance, and we also apologise for the fact that that might mean that we don't have time for any uh, questions. Uh, if our other speaker doesn't turn up, then that might give us an element of flexibility. But otherwise, I'd ask for your patience in that, and if you would like to ask questions, maybe you could save them and talk to the speakers during the coffee break that follows this session. Right, so let's get on immediately. Um, can I introduce our first speaker here? Would you like to come up? So we've got Mr. Roar uh, Sadenen from the Norwegian Veterinary Institute in Trondheim. Thank you very much. Uh, my talk uh, is about uh, eradication of alien crayfish. Which is meant to be put it up here. Uh, it's called Past Experiences and Future Possibilities. Um, I represent the uh, Norwegian Veterinary Institute. Um, we are mainly a research institute, uh, but we also carry out the eradications uh, for invasive fish and crayfish. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, the European Union issued two documents highly relevant for the management of invasive alien crayfish in Europe. Crayfish are one of the most successful and widely distributed invasive species in the world. I will report eradication confirmation of single crayfish from two areas in Norway and discuss this in relation to past experiences and future possibilities. Uh, the EU uh, Regulation 1143 uh, on the prevention and management of the introduction and spread of invasive alien, alien species entered into force in January 2015. In July 2016, the EU list of invasive alien species that requires action was adopted. The list includes five different crayfish species. Uh, the EU Regulation on uh, IAS includes restrictions on keeping, importing, selling, breeding, and growing listed species. Member states will be required to take measures for early detection and rapid eradication of listed species. If a new population is detected, there is an eradication obligation, while for widely spread species management measures must be taken, must, must take place. Member states select the measures appropriate to the local conditions and will not have an obligation to eradicate IAS of union concern that are already widely spread on their territory. At least 10 alien crayfish species has been introduced to Europe. The five indigenous European freshwater crayfish species are all, are, are all threatened from different factors, but the, but the most detrimental are probably the North American signal crayfish and the crayfish uh, plague caused by the parasite uh, Apollonisus astarchi. Singles uh, can carry the plague and they kill the Norwegian native local crayfish. Except some eradications performed in the United Kingdom, Sweden and Norway, there has not been much effort put into eradication and, uh, of invasive species throughout Europe. The reasons for this are probably complex uh, and differ between countries. It seems that only chemical-based treatments offer any hope for effective eradication. Both uh, successful eradications in Norway involve two separate consecutive 
treatments, separated by two weeks and a partial, a partial drainage of some of the ponds. They were performed in locations with several ponds and small streams and involved the application of a synthetic pyrethroid uh, a pharmaceutical called Petamox. Petamox is a cytromethane based pharmaceutical uh, originally developed for treatment of salmon louse infestations uh, um, in Atlantic salmon farms. Synthetic pyrethroids are a common agent in many insecticides licensed throughout Europe. Uh, they have low toxicity to birds, mammals, plants, and many invertebrates. They are, however, in varying degrees toxic to non target fauna, including crustaceans, insects, arthropods, fish, and amphibians. Uh, pyrethroids do not persist in the environment for long periods, they do not accumulate in the biosphere, and do not biomagnify in the food chain. The requirements uh, set by the Norwegian Food Safety Authority for issue, uh, issuing an eradication confirmation of single crayfish are described in Jonsson et al. Uh, uh, and based on the total of the in investigations involved the, in eradication confirmation, the Norwegian Food Safety Authority can issue a self-declaration uh, of freedom of disease. Uh, the first treatment we did was in Dommane. Uh, the dominant treatment was the first attempted crayfish eradication in Norway. Dominant drainage consists of five small ponds, uh, the largest measure measuring approximately 2,000 square meters surface area. No sur surviving crayfish was observed or found during the second treatment in 2008 or during the rain down of the ponds. The, the county governor carried out trials with caged live global crayfish in 2010 and 2011 and the Norwegian Food Safety Authority uh, uh, final advice was to issue an eradication confirmation in, the sp in spring 2012 based on these results. Uh, the treatment is described in, uh, in more detail in Sanjum and uh, Jonsson 2012. The next treatment was on Ustea. It uh, consisted of six ponds. The largest pond was measuring 2,242 square meters with an average depth of 3 meters. No surviving crayfish was observed or found during the second treatment in 2009 or during the rain down of the ponds. The, the county governor carried out trials with caged live crayfish in 2013 and 2014 and no signs of crayfish plague was detected. In 2014, trapping trials for crayfish was carried out and no crayfish were caught. In due to 2014, the Norwegian Veterinary Institute also collected water samples for analysis of crayfish plague spores in two of the treated ponds, and no spores were detected. On the basis of these results, the county governor concluded that the single crayfish and the clayfish plague is eradicated from the infected ponds, and the Norwegian Food Safety Authority will issue an eradication confirmation this summer. What are the future possibilities? Uh, what is left to say uh, in Europe? There are still significant uh, native crayfish populations in Europe, which are being decimated to the spread of introduced invasive alien crayfish. Action to control invasive alien crayfish could protect these rare and valuable species. Equally, their impacts are wider, ranging from damage to river and flood, uh, and flood uh, uh, defense banks to the impact on recreational fisheries. So there is a case for action based on both ecological and socio-economic factors. <coughs> is eradication of alien crayfish possible and desirable? Well, we have the scientific evidence base regarding the species, their risks and impacts. We have the processes to make a robust case, uh, tools, techniques and expertise to take action. And now we also have the powers under, under the EU IAS regulations to make that a uh, reality. Uh, are the main reasons for not eradicating legislative constraints? Uh, many countries lack effective legislation to carry out proactive management and control of invasive uh, alien crayfish species. And legislation to, uh, to allow action to control the spread or attempt to eradicate once invasive species uh, have been legally introduced has been missing in many countries. That has all changed with the introduction of the EU IAS regulations. 
which provide member states uh, me um, uh, with mechanisms to issue spe species control or orders and the powers behind them to take direct action to eradicate high-risk invasive species. We have yet to see how this regulation will be enforced. Uh, is there an unwillingness to eradicate? Uh, where the threats have been recognized, there seems to have been willingness to take action within the regulatory agencies and conservation bodies at ground level. But uh, that has been hampered by the lack of legislative powers, scientific evidence base, political backing, and funding. And this has also been combined with the lack of public will. Is there a lack of knowledge? Uh, and expertise. Uh, Biocide programs have only fairly recently become an alternative. Conventional means like netting, trapping, electrofishing, grain down, liming, etc. have been the answer. All of the above methods try to attempt eradication of invasive alien, alien crayfish, but none have achieved more than population reduction. As in Norway, this is now changing. <coughs> and the expertise, tools and techniques we have developed for application of rotenone based fiscicides are directly transferable to application of biocides for crayfish management. These methods have been tried and found to be very effective if applied correctly. These pictures are from large uh, rotenone treatments in Norway, carried out by the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. Uh, my colleague, Hauge Varal, will give a talk about this later today. And uh, another colleague of mine, um, Björn, Trade also has a poster describing some of the equipment used. A total eradication of invasive alien crayfish in Europe is no longer feasible, but emphasis should be, uh, should be made in sust sustaining viable island populations of native crayfish and creating new ones. Eradication programs should be made an option throughout Europe during identification and establishment of suitable island populations and areas. We have the knowledge and expertise to carry out success, successful eradications and hopefully the new EU regulation can be of help when securing necessary legislation and funding. time there, which means we actually have time for one question, if there's one quick question. You were first with your hand up, sir, at the back. You mentioned that better marks have uh, toxicity to non-target organisms. Did you observe any effect when you use it? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the invented insects, and especially the, the crayfish species, uh, are killed. So uh, we restock um, uh, with the, the original fauna after after the Okay, and a, a very quick answer as well. So there was another one. Was it you in front? Yeah, Laura. In Norway, do people who eat crayfish? Yeah. Is it widely spread? Is it that the reason for spread? How long the populations of crayfish around ponds? Probably. Uh, they are only native to the southern parts of Norway, the northern crayfish. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are highly sought after as a food source, and people are known to go to Sweden and pick up the crayfish there and put in their legs. Yeah. But it also have a, a natural, uh, the barrier to Sweden isn't uh, 100%, so it also migrates over the border. Okay, thank you very Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. 
as uh, the chair said, I'm Miguel Rianda. I'm Miguel Angel, but there is a mistake in the, in the program, so if you look uh, for me, it's Miguel Rianda. Okay, I'm a, I'm a professor at the University of the Balearic Islands, teaching zoology, and my research is on entomology. Just a little introduction for those that doesn't know where the Balearic Islands are, in the western part of the Mediterranean Sea. It's composed by three major islands, Mallorca, Menorca, and Visa, and two small islands, Cabrera and Formentera. Cabrera is a national park. And just some data of interest, the population in the Balearic Islands is around one million people, and we receive around 28 million visitors annually, which is, and probably we, we are gonna break the record this, this year. As you know, the commercial activities, as you probably know, is it's mainly services, tourists, and there is some agriculture still left there in the, in the Balearics. So just to show you a very nice picture of the Balearics, this is the Balearics we like to promote, nature and a lot of natural resources and values, and not probably the image of the Balearics that you have here in the British tabloids. Uh, we can play showing, showing disasters in Magaluf and things like that. So there is, there is other Balearic island that is really worth it to visit. Okay, and we are dealing, of course, with invasive species. We are not, uh, we are not uh, avoiding the entrance of so, some of these species. We are dealing with bigger animals like snakes, rats, and so on, and there are other colleagues from the Balearic Islands that will talk about that. But we are dealing also with very tiny insects like uh, in, uh, like the mosquitoes and um, red palm weevil, and precisely I'm going to put some of the examples of the invertebrates that we are working with and dealing with in the Balearic Islands, and try to compare these four invertebrates, which are the Asian tiger mosquito, the red palm weevil, the South American tomato moth, and the Asian hornet recently introduced in the Balearics. What I'm comparing these four species because they are completely different in the kind of ecosystem they occupy and also the management is also very, very different because of the requirements needed. So the first is the famous Asian tiger mosquito. It is widely distributed all around the world in all the temperate and tropical ecosystems and is, it's introduced in places mainly by the transport of used tires or maybe plants like the lucky bamboo. This is now the situation in Europe with these very nice maps produced by ECDC and EFSA and as you could see here it's completely spread all over the Mediterranean uh, basin including also other parts of Europe plus uh, Turkey. And we sampled this mosquito basically using uh, um, oviposition traps, but still we don't have in the Balearic Islands a, a proper map of the distribution. This is the beginning of the invasion when we recorded the first uh, populations of the mosquito in the western uh, part of the island. There are other maps that uh, are completed a little bit this information, but now we have other techniques, as for example some apps that allows you to know the distribution of adults by people sending pictures <coughs> and some experts identifying those pictures as the tiger mosquito. Uh, but the path of entry for us is clearly a species that is introduced in a new area through transport, through maritime, maritime transport may, mainly, and probably by private cars. This is the case of Ibiza where we were analyzing the pathway of introduction and for example you have around uh, uh, 35,000 or almost 36,000 cars uh, in, this, in this period from 2010 to 2013. And just in 2014, we have around 60,000 uh, cars traveling from, one, from mainland to, to Ibiza. So it's a, it's a lot of people moving and mosquitoes get into the cars and move from one place to another place for free without paying any. <laughs> this is the, these are the breeding sites of the mosquito tiger, very difficult to control because as you see, uh, these species could breed in any volume of water that you could find in any place, suburban, peri, peri urban areas and also some, uh, in, even some natural areas. The importance of Aedes uh, albopictus, this mosquito is basically because uh, uh, is a transmitter of different arboviruses, including chikungunya, dengue, and recently it has been also 
are related to Zika virus and uh, I don't know if to say fortunately or unfortunately, but for sure since the last summer people is much more concerned about mosquito transmitted diseases because of the Zika event that occurred last summer, as I say. So the awareness of, of people about mosquitoes increased and now we are paying more attention to these invasive species. Another example is the red palm weevil. In this case, it attacks the palms. It's also distributed in tropical and subtropical and temperate areas. And this is now the situation in the Balearic since the introduction in 2006 is completely spread in all the Balearics. This is the number of palm trees uh, affected by the red palm weevil. And as you can see, it's right now completely unstoppable. And it started in this area in 2006, but it was not properly managed and spread it all over the islands. Which is the economical and social impacts? Of course, palms are very, very expensive. This is the number of palms affected in Mallorca just in this period. It's very, uh, a palm tree this size is very, is very costly. And of course, one issue that sometimes is not mentioned is that most of these palm trees are they have a, some emotional input on the people because they are planted many years ago and they really suffer if they need to, to cut the tree and destroy the tree. So it's, it's also a cultural heritage. And now it's compulsory to treat the, against the red palm weevil, but it's also costly. It is supposed to be mandatory. There's supposed to be fines if you don't uh, comply with the obligations. But in the reality, nobody is supplying any of the fines. So the red palm weevil is completely free to go from one place to another place. Another example that I took this particularly was from the agriculture point of view. It's nothing related to ecosystems, just agrosystems. And in this case was introduced in Spain in 2006 and also introduced in the Balearics the next, the, the same year. So it was a, a, a plant pest that was really, really rapidly spread in all the Mediterranean because there was a lack of biosecurity measures to try to control all this plant transportation. And of course, if it's not controlled, there is a, a possibility of having 100% losses. However, comparing with other invasive species in natural ecosystems, in agricultural ecosystems, usually the commercial uh, machinery is developing control methods and monitoring methods really rapidly. So this disease is completely under control by the farmers if they have the proper tools. And finally, our last visitor was the Asian hornet, Vespa velutina, that was introduced in Spain, in Spain in 2010, and then in the Balearics uh, two years ago in, in 2015. It's a very big hornet that you could easily identify. The nests are also really, really big. And <coughs> the, main, the main issue is that predates on bees. So this is the particular economical issue that also decreased the uh, honey production. But from the ecological point of view, decrease the number of pollinators, as you know, bees are really, really important. On this case, we were working on trying to engage local communities, so we developed an, an app that you could also identify, uh, take pictures of what you think is a, is a wasp and send it to the experts, and then we are producing different maps of the distribution of this wasp, which is, which is really difficult to, to uh, locate uh, by other means. They are not uh, monitoring, monitoring tools easy to apply on the field. And also, this is very important also to have this all social media, the people is in contact and they could send you pictures or comments. And in, in this kind of things, we engage the local community. Well, I was trying just to summarize here, comparing the four species. And for example, of course, for any invasive species, the most important is the early detection. It this depends on a series of factors, for example, the type of ecosystem, if it's natural, semi-natural, or if it's an agro-system, the size and the shape of the insect, if it's easy to identify by the people. In this case, of course, the red palm weevil and the Asian hornet is really easy to identify 
the Asian tiger mosquitoes is not so easy, so you need to really educate people to try to identify those different uh, species which are different. The life cycle of the insect, of course, it's not the same to be uh, to have an insect which is uh, clearly exposed or not. And finally, if there are available monitoring methods, control methods, and all these will promote to engage the participation of the community. And that's all. Thank you very much. To time, that means we have the opportunity for one question. One quick question. At the back. Um, is there any process to verify the citizen science observations? So is there any follow up? I mean, well, there is a there is panel of experts that really gives the big feedback to the to the people that sends the pictures. So it's not just putting pictures there; it's completely verified by a panel of experts. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. is Chris Green. Uh, on this occasion he's speaking on behalf of co-workers as well, uh, but he also has a, a paper later in the session. So this one is Abstract 100 if you want to find that in your pack. Uh, but uh, Chris is from the Department of Conservation in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, thank you very much. So this talk basically I'm going to describe um, the test which was the large white butterfly, sometimes we refer to it as the great white butterfly in New Zealand. Um, and how basically two government agencies came to different conclusions about treating this particular incursion, uh, bearing in mind that, that to our knowledge there's been no successful eradication of any pest butterfly uh, in the world so far. So just quickly I'll skate through the life history of the species. Um, so large white butterfly lays lots of eggs at once, up to 100, they will hatch at once, and these caterpillars tend to be um, aggregated uh, as they proceed through their life. So they hunt in packs if you like, and they're slightly larger than the small white butterfly, oddly enough. So there's a picture of the caterpillars at the bottom there. The large white butterfly has a chemical defense uh, system, so it doesn't mind being seen by birds, and thus it's quite different to look at than the small white, which is highly camouflaged. The large white, therefore, is easier to see, but being larger, it does a lot more damage to your cabbages. However, we weren't concerned in the Department of Conservation about cabbages. We were very concerned about its potential impact on a variety of indigenous uh, plant species, in particular, cresses, which we've got 79 odd species in New Zealand, and there's a 90% rate uh, of endemic in this group. Some of them are very significant to our uh, indigenous Maori people, and in particular, we've got uh, the iconic cooked scurvy grass as a member of the group. Most of them live in isolated coastal communities, as the picture there shows, this one plant in the foreground, um, coastal fever grass. And many of these species are highly threatened already. And you can see here we've lost two species already in this one genus, the Lepidium. Um, and there's a variety of those species here which are nationally critical. They are on the brink of extinction. Um, and this butterfly we know, this, from the small white um, perturbations, will likely be um, affecting these plants. This is Lepidium uh, banksii, one of the most highly threatened species. Um, and that's a picture of just how it's growing, basically, in cavity. If a single large white female butterfly was to lay a batch of eggs in that um, plant, it would be toast. Uh, and likely the local community of those plants mm -hmm. would be toast as well. This is the total world distribution of this coastal um, lepidium. And you can see here, we've got two sites which are still original sites, and all the rest uh, we've been busy trying to uh, have transportation sites to uh, make sure the species survives. And just for your information, Nelson uh, city is just in this area down here. But that is Nelson Bay, it's the top of the South Island, uh, quite a restricted area. So, why is Nelson important? Because that was where the large white butterfly was first found in May 2010. A member of the public called in. She'd seen some caterpillars she didn't recognise, and sure enough. So, the species over here in Europe is known to be migratory, uh, and that tailored the thinking of the early um, people involved in the Ministry of Primary Industries who are the primary biosecurity agency for New Zealand and responsible for dealing with incursions of new pests. So um, MPI looked at three potential options. 
for this. It was already known as a species of concern for us, an unwanted organism, if you will. And so they looked at eradication, they looked at monitoring or do nothing option, and basically they chose the monitoring option um, involving just tracking the distribution and the increase of it. So by the end of 2011, um, we had 39 confirmed sites of the large white butterfly. All of these were within six kilometres of the port, um, and mostly within two kilometres. And by spring 2012, a year later, there were up to 96 sites that had been verified, but they all were still within six kilometres of the port. So clearly it had not picked up and gone, it had not migrated over the hill and disappeared into the distance. But in spring 2012, MPI was then decided um, they were going to relinquish control of the operation. Um, they thought that it, it wasn't uh, feasible to eradicate, and so they left it, and we immediately picked up the response and elevated it to an eradication program. So the essence here is why the two government agencies, Department of Conservation and Ministry, Prime Ministries, have the same data in front of them and arrive at different conclusions, where we decided to go for eradication. So it's just in the background, if you like, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. So this was the distribution of the uh, butterfly at the time that the Department of Conservation took it over. This is Nelson, this is the Port of Nelson, where we think it most likely came in. Most of the records were in the central Nelson area. There's a few outliers up here and one down here, which we were very concerned about to get onto quite quickly. So just to remind you again, the natural dis distribution of this highly endangered press species, and this is the area where the, the butterfly was established, just down there. So the eradication basically had the initial goals to eliminate those outliers and, and keep a, a handle, if you like, on its spread, as well as working to try and reduce uh, numbers in the core. The program was entirely based around visual protection. Um, there was no known lures for the species, despite extensive work over in Europe here, um, trying to determine the way a female attracts the male. So basically visual protection was our only option, and that was done by having large numbers of people in the field, basically going door to door, looking in people's backyards for host plants, and determining whether or not we had the uh, butterfly present. We removed the pests, we bred those up um, to make sure that uh, they had, if they had parasitism, um, we would record that. Um, all host plants uh, were treated either with an organic insecticide or the plants were removed, depending on what the landowner's choice was. And we also had a separate team of people looking for wild host plants, in particular in the a very important host for this species. So these teams were basically scouring Nelson for areas of, particularly on cliff bases, that sort of thing, uh, of wild host plants. And throughout the program, we were collecting intensive amounts of data, huge amounts of data we collected for analysis to, to understand how far we were through the program. And this was of critical importance. So briefly, just this is how it played out at time. Um, when part conservation took over, this was the distribution of the red dots, if you like. The green dots are where there's tests and that haven't been detected. So playing through that first year, 2012-13, um, numbers were basically increasing. And through the spring 2013, again, a higher number compared to that. Again, here, higher numbers, but then slightly in autumn we felt we were getting somewhere. It's the first indication that with the numbers of people we had in the field and with the methods we were using, it was being effective. Reduction in, the, in winter. And then in spring 2014, the dramatic reduction you can see in the numbers. And the last butterfly was seen in December 2014. So quite a rapid removal, if you like. And then we persisted with the monitoring, all those green knots, for uh, another 12 months, basically, to ensure that we had succeeded. And this, this is a uh, graphical uh, uh, playing of the numbers, basically. The numbers were increasing um, generation by generation until basically then things started to, to work for us in 2014, leading to a long tail at the end there. So, physiology eradication. Um, what's important for us in New Zealand is we form technical advisory groups as a starting point for this generally. We get together experts, and it's very important to have experts who have eradication experience. Um, there's quite a mindset for eradication, as you all understand, which is quite different from a control mentality. Um, the work of the TAG group basically is highly subjective. We're evaluating constantly on a variety of uh, information sources, but we don't know the absolute, and particularly in this case with a butterfly, and where there's no lure um, and no successful past history to, to work with. So the work of the TAG basically is to arrive at a likelihood of, or probability of success, if you like, based on percentage. And we do that looking at six criteria, and you'll all be familiar with this from Bomford and O'Brien. Those are six standard criteria uh, used in any evaluation, if you like, of likelihood of success. I'd like to go through this um, in detail. 
differential humility. Cost-benefit analysis is a very important part of that, and this is a major plank for the Ministry for Primary Industries in New Zealand. They lean heavily on a cost-benefit analysis in order to be able to get money to go to eradicate something in the field. They have to go to Treasury to get that money, and cost-benefit is a key part of that. Typically, um, a ratio of 3 to 1 benefit cost is used. <coughs> if it um, gets above that ratio, then it's basically likely to be a green light. In this particular conclusion, um, NPI did three cost-benefit analysis and DOC did one, subsequent to us taking over. We all came to different conclusions in that cost-benefit analysis. So what does that tell you? It tells you there's a lot of variability in there, even with a, a so-called structured process. And part of that is because we're dealing with the potential loss of a species, a loss of biodiversity, and it's very difficult to put a dollar term on. So you're at the subjective assessments um, of those criteria right along the line, and that introduces a great deal of uncertainty and thus different conclusions in the CBA. Um, so the likelihood of the success options. Um, as part of that, the each CBA, CBA will contain a variety of options. <coughs> so just tracking through the, uh, the responsible for dates, you can see there that NPI to start with and then DOC subsequently. And the likelihood of success is estimated at the different times through different CBAs uh, and through uh, towards the end, particularly for advisor group. You can see there in the middle the likelihood it's very all over the place, basically. But as we gathered more data, we had greater certainty, so it's not really fair to compare the figures. But in the first three CBAs, a lot of variation is what you're, you know, you're faced with here. And so, lessons for future incursions. Um, to be clear about the drivers, now clearly. You know, DOC was driven by fear in this case. Fear that we would lose species. Uh, I've been involved in biosecurity for over 30 years. I've been a member of many technical advisory groups as part of my work. And this one, above anything else I've been involved with, was dramatically a um, huge risk to our biodiversity. So that's part of what was a driver for DOC. There was less of that driver for the Ministry of Primary Industry. Um, it's important to actively fill knowledge gaps as soon as you can. To gather information during the response or even prior to your response is critical. And more information could have been gained earlier in this particular sort of a heads up. Um, in particular, on pest seasonality, uh, the distribution of the pest that's expanding, but the abundance of you can get that. It's quite difficult, but to get that is, is crucial. We recognise the limitations of the CBA process as a result of this response in particular. Um, it, it highlighted that, and I think because we're dealing with biodiversity losses, um, and the power of having a tag, which in this case we were very fortunate to have a good combination of highly experienced um, scientists involved. Um, a lot of them were doing the modelling for us of data that was collected throughout the program, and this was able to show us whether we needed more resources or we were getting where we needed to go, etc. Um, and we shaped the program as we continued on based on um, the advice from that tag group. And of course, um, startup delays do obviously uh, involve an extension of the cost. So, there are the two other ones. Thank you. Again, one quick question, and somebody was very quick off the mark. Hi, um, I was just interested to see how you managed to keep it going when you got down to 30 percent probability of success. Yes. Did you did you get a lot of pressure at that point? Or? Well, that, the thirty percent success was the last of the CBAs done by MPI, and basically on that on the strength of that they decided they would leave. So that was their assessment. Um, we were doing um, assessments in the background and through that final twelve months when MPI were deciding whether or not they would leave, and we were trying to push them not to leave. Um, and so that was their justification for leaving. Basically, at that thirty percent, we clearly had different drivers. So, uh, we look at it in a different eye, a different eye face. Okay, thank you.
So this is essentially why we came to this problem. We knew that parasitoid wasps seem to be very important in controlling um, fulmus downside on the mainland, and so we wanted to see if there are any potential um, parasitoid wasps that we can use to control that species in Galapagos. And we started from a point of wanting to find a species that was highly very specific to fulmus downside. And so this is the snail and mirror. So we've been doing some work um, on mainland Ecuador with potential parasitoids that we could use as a biological control agent. Um, and we've, not, um, we've come up with this novel paradigm. Um, field experiment that would allow us to exclude one species from the outset. And so essentially what Ismail has been doing is he's been looking for Florida's down by PP in nest boxes. He's been pairing these nest boxes with bait boxes which contain non-target species. The idea being that any parasitoid that comes in will have the opportunity to parasitize both the Lordis and any non-targets. In that way we can exclude any species that do parasitize um, flies that are found in both um, the nest boxes and the bait boxes. And so we found a number of species, but the most promising so far is this species, Camura annulifera, which is this childhood parasitoid wasp. Um, and so this is what we've been focusing on <coughs> our efforts on for the last couple of years. And so we've been using a holistic approach to try and um, understand uh, a little bit more about the basic biology of the species and whether it's likely to be highly host specific enough to justify um, introduction to biological control in the Galapagos. And so I'm going to talk about a few of these approaches today. Um, so first of all, I'm going to, one of the first things we wanted to do is look at a bit more about historical records, um, where can your annual has been reported in the past. And so we found that it's been found in Central and South America, but it's never been found attacking any species outside of the genus Flornis, suggesting that in the wild it's only attacking Flornis and has a preference for these flies. But this is fairly data limited, it was only from four studies and we know absolutely nothing about it life history or basic biology. And so that's really where we needed to start um, our experimental work. And so this first um, this first component of the study was done by Marianne Valgarella, another postdoc in the lab. And so she um, read the wasp and the flies in the lab and found that pinea annulifera is exclusively a pupil parasitoid, so it only attacks the pupil stage of the lordus. It won't attack eggs, or larvae, or adults. She also found that it was a solitary parasitoid, so it only lays a single egg per host, as opposed to a various species which would lay multiple eggs per host. Um, and that it was an ectoparasitoid, so it lays its egg on the outside of its host. But more interestingly, um, it's actually what we consider to be a gap layer, so it's not a true ectoparasitoid. It lays its egg here in the gap between the developing pupa and the hard outer puparium. And this is really interesting, um, I think, because this gap is exclusive to um, a group of flies called the Cyclorapha, which includes flies such as the Muscadi, which flies belong to, the Cyclophagidae, the, Cy um, the Pelicori, and the Serpidae. And so what, we've, what I hypothesized with this was that this deposition site would restrict the host range of these species, making them potentially better biological control agents in terms of the likelihood of non-target effects. Um, and so this is something I tested using a phylogenetic comparative approach. Um, and so you can see here the phylogeny of the chalcedoid wasps to which Camura annulifera belongs. So in black we have the gap layers, in yellow the ectoparasitoids, and in orange the endoparasitoids. And so what I found using this method um, was that the gap layers and endoparasitoids, so this, this should be coloured, but it, it's gone grey. Um, so the gap layers and endoparasitoids had much more, more narrow host range, so they were restricted by um, the physiology of their host compared to the ectoparasitoid, suggesting gap layers like neuroangulifera and other endoparasitoids um, are likely to be better um, candidates for biological control because they're less likely to have non target effects because their host range is limited by the physiology of their host. Um, I also used a study to look at evolutionary patterns um, in, in these species. And what I saw was that um, gap laying appears to impose evolutionary constraints on these species. Um, and so what we see here is changes towards and away from each state, uh, and the gap layers here in white. And so compared to endoparasitoids and ectoparasitoids, gap layers are less likely to transition away from that state, um, suggesting gap laying is essentially an evolutionary dead end. What we also saw was that um, most transitions towards gap laying occurred at the phylogeny tips, and anything that occurred in the middle of the phylogeny um, wasn't conserved. And that suggests that processes such as high extinction risk um, and um, failure to speciate diversify might be something that is constraining evolution in these gap layers, which again suggests that 
These could be really beneficial species when we're looking to do biological control by introducing them into novel habitats because they're unlikely to diversify to attack other species that are present there. So this is all really interesting, but it's all quite circumstantial evidence. So what we need to do is some of the more traditional close-range studies that are typically used for biological control. Uh, and so this is some more work that Mariana Volgarella conducted in a lab in the University of Minnesota. She exposed a range of pupae of um, non-target species to Pinura anilifera to see whether it will parasitize these species. And she didn't find any evidence that it could successfully parasitize any non-target host that she um, presented it with. And this wasn't an artifact of lab culturing because um, in the same conditions, it would parasitize the target host for all this downside. Um, and so this suggests that this species isn't parasitizing anything else successfully. But what it doesn't tell us is whether, what the, the basis of this um, host specificity is. Um, and so one question that I had, um, which isn't normally asked by, question, by um, people doing biological control host range studies, is why, why the species is specific to for its downside. Is it because it can't, um, it can't parasitize any other host, or is it because it doesn't attempt to? And so one possibility is that it's stinging these hosts, laying eggs on them, but they're not developing successfully. Um, and we can start to look at that by calculating the correct mortality, which is essentially the mortality in the control treatment, where the, where the people aren't exposed to the parasitoid, and the mortality when they're exposed to the parasitoid in the absence of successful parasitism. So for full on downside, this is 34%, which suggests that even in the absence of successful parasitism, um, this was, is um, causing mortality of, of the target host species for this downside. So we looked at this for all of the other non-target host species, um, and we didn't find any significant departures from zero. So there were some where it was positive, but this wasn't significantly different from zero, suggesting that um, pure annular isn't even attempting to attack any of these species. Um, and further behavioral observations that I've conducted suggest that it will just ignore them. Um, so this host specificity we know to be at least very, at the very least, behaviorally, um, a, a behavioral cause. Um, so this is all very promising. It suggests that Pinura annulifera is highly specific to the lawless downside, and it could be a very valuable tool for conservation in the Galapagos. Um, all of the approach we've used suggests that it's a specialist on the But what we really need to do now is understand a little bit more about what Pinura annulifera would be expected to do in the appropriate context, so in the Galapagos. Um, Obviously, in, on islands, particularly in the Galapagos, there's very high rates of endemism, and so many of these species would be extremely vulnerable to a novel parasitoid because they lack any co-evolutionary history with this parasitoid. But the, the work that I presented today allows us to, to start narrowing down the list of non-target species we would want to test in the Galapagos. Um, to, first of all, a whole metabolism insect, so insects at the pupil stage, because we know that Pneura annulifera is a pupil parasitoid. Um, and then finally, to the Diptera, specifically the Cyclorhaphian diptera that have this gap. So these are the species that would be most likely at risk were any, um, were any introduction to be attempted. And so this is what we're hoping to do in the next year or so. Um, we're looking to get permission to bring pure annulifera into a quarantine lab in the Galapagos uh, and begin to test um, some of these particularly at risk non-target species in order to determine whether um, this species would be promising to control the longest downside and potentially save all the species. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank all of our collaborators um, and funders, and I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, can I just check whether we have Melissa Horton or any of the co workers here? Oh.
introduce Melissa Horton. Uh, she is from the Centre for Biodiversity and Conservation Science at the University of Queensland in Australia. And uh, she's presenting a talk on behalf of herself and some other Hi there. Yeah, so I'm with the University of Queensland, but I sit in Tasmania and work in conjunction with the Antarctic Division. I'm going to talk to you today about my work uh, is using vertebrates to monitor ecosystem change on Macquarie Island following eradication. So we all know uh, these practice conservation on islands is attractive because of high biodiversity on islands. Also invasive species on islands have the biggest impact um, on endemic island endemic species. As a result, um, the management of invasive species is high conservation return. And although we have a range of actions available to us to manage um, invasive species, eradication has become the most popular because if, although it's expensive, it's a one-off investment. As a result, eradication is increased in numbers and success. So we know all these things, but when we think about success, what we're talking about is the removal of target species. What is its success in terms of the ecosystem response? And this is something we know less about. So my work is actually part of a larger project trying to determine uh, island ecosystem response to eradication. And Jess Bird is also here we'll talking later about um, growing petrol response. But the work is uh, led by Dr. Justine Shaw from the University of Queensland and it's funded by the Australian Government. And we have more than industry and government partners. So the work is looking at optimal monitoring, uh, trying to assess conservation benefits of eradications and conservation actions, trying to determine the return on investment, looking at baselines, how you monitor into the future and determine response and success, and looking at novel ecosystems and species interactions. So my interest in this work stems from my involvement in the um, Macquarie Island Test Eradication Project. Uh, Macquarie Island is an island of Tasmania, it's halfway between Tasmania and Antarctica, and recently rabbits, rats and mice were removed from this island. So these are my dogs, Hamish and Wayne, and together we removed the last adult rabbit off the island and her babies were found shortly afterwards. So it's great to be involved in that. And now I've returned to assess the post eradication response. So you can see behind there is uh, tussock melons. This is uh, rabbit damage on the island. Um, severe uh, vegetation damage. One unique uh, sub-antarctic yeah. flora that's evolved in the absence of herbivores. That was also the greatest threatened species habitat, such as Alpha's nesting sites, and caused widespread landscape destruction. You can see their landslips. Yeah. And we know that rats consume seeds and also predated on burrowed birds and albatross chicks, and rats and mice predated on invertebrates, particularly uh, spiders, moths, and beetles. But we knew that the ecosystem had potential to recover. We could see that. And now this is what we're seeing. We're seeing lush vegetation regrowth, albatross slope recovery, and the return in some area of invertebrate uh, vegetation cover uh, in, in some areas. And an overall greening of the island. So the signs are good. And you can see there, you might say, success. But what is actually happening in the ecosystem? That we don't know. Generally, post eradication uh, monitoring focuses on charismatic species, particularly seabird recovery. But what is actually happening in the ecosystem? And when we spend $25 million on eradication, policy managers, the policy makers and managers are asking, well, what have we got to be paid for? And how do we know? What do we measure from? What's the baseline? A lot of islands uh, were data poor. How do we know? Uh, what's happening in the future and, and to manage for future issues. And are there other species in the ecosystem interacting differently post eradication? Uh, are we dealing with a novel ecosystem altogether? Which brings me to invertebrates. So, invertebrates um, are known by indicators, often used in freshwater environments. They've got a high abundance of diversity, they, they respond quickly, they grow, they grow quickly, they've got fast life cycles. Um, and they can determine, they can tell us a lot about a wide range of uh, ecological um, function, um, you know, species composition, turnover. Um, 
sorry, community composition turnover and just general environmental um, health. In the sub Antarctica, they're particularly important because they dominate the coastal fauna and they drive the new nutrient cycling on the islands. So the aim of this portion of my project is to investigate the changes in community abundance and invertebrates um, and diversity over time and space, establish a baseline for future monitoring, assess the status of non-native invertebrate species in the environment. There's still 56 non-native invertebrate species in the Quarry Island environment, how they behave in coastal eradication. And to do this, I'm going to use historical data and also collect contemporary data um, and sort of do an analysis of the time of how this has changed. I'm going to develop a spatially and temporally explicit data set and use multivariate techniques um, to assess uh, changes in biodiversity over time. This tells you the uh, range of historic trapping that I'm preparing with. You can see that since the 1960s, there's been a range of a lot of researchers doing invertebrate monitoring across the island. At the bottom here, there's sweet netting, pitfall trapping, yellow pan, um, yellow, sorry, yellow pan traps, beating, pine <coughs> counts, uh, litter sampling, soil quarrying, and pan collecting. So you can see over time that people have used a range of different techniques. There's been no standard. In fact, even though some of them look like similar, they've used different sizes, different mediums, different preservatives, different number of cores. There's been no real standard over time. So what I'm going to try and do is I've uh, chosen sampling techniques that are best compared with historical techniques and I'm going to, um, so I'm trapping over three seasons on the quarry island and using historical data to assess changes over time. So these, these guys are also, um, in the 60s, the rabbit numbers on the island were quite high and then they reduced with the mixing at this time and then they went up again around this time. So the, the vegetation changed a lot during this, this time. So this is just tells you where the island is. For those who don't know, between Tasmania and Antarctica, about 35 days long. I re-established 10 historic sites in the north of the island. Most of the historic trapping was in the north. And I've also established 14 sites around the island in five different vegetation types. So pitfall trapping, litter sampling, pine counts, um, uh, beating, and litter. This area. This just gives you an idea of the preliminary results if you're in preliminary so far, but you can see that some vegetation types already you can see have a different, some vegetation types of species all invertebrates, and some invertebrates across all vegetation types, and then some vegetation groups like this um, is herb field, which is interestingly heavily impacted by rabbits, has quite a low diversity of invertebrates. This is likely to change over time because I've I've been taking this sample back to Australia and identifying them, which is a huge job, and I'm only one year into my ID, so I've got two more years to go um, to get a good idea of what's going on. What I've also found, which is really great for um, sort of species recovery monitoring, is that different traps are better depending on what you want to find. So here you can see, you can see the pitfalls generally go all around, you can see the spring tails, um, so different traps, what happens is they sort of trap invertebrates in different strata of vegetation that um, invertebrates occupy. So you can see springtails are sort of ubiquitous, they're everywhere. You can also see if you're interested in um, beetle recovery following a rat eradication, pitfalls would be a good option. Um, if you're interested in spider recovery, you wouldn't use sweet netting. So it's kind of interesting to see, in terms of optimising monitoring post eradication, how you would use um, the available tools to get, for, depending on what answers you're looking for. Other things we've seen, preliminary results, uh, an increase in um, uh, groups of invertebrates that were directly predated upon, such as spiders and moss, we know that. Increasing range of abundance across the island. I expect with more uh, analysis, we know that vegetation cover um, strongly affects a, a, a large group of invertebrates due to habitat modification. So in time, I expect to see changes in um, more groups of invertebrates. We've also seen um, invasive species activities. Invasive springtails appear to displace the native species where they co-occur. And I've also detected a range expansion of a predatory platform <coughs> from previously restricted site to now all over the island, basically. So we don't actually know how these invasive species 
um, interacting with the environment there or how to manage this, um, but potentially that affects a uh, wide ranging. So now we have, we're still investigating questions of how to manage these basic species. We know they continually arrive. And my other work shows that they're repeatedly repeated <coughs> introduced, even if they're known invertebrates. And there's also another flatworm that if there's an issue of reverse biosecurity back to Tasmania, it doesn't exist there, but it's quite a um, destructive crop pest. So control of eradication is difficult, um, not unheard of as we've seen, but definitely difficult. And then we just, we still don't know how to manage this or how this will affect the ecosystem. These are further questions that we're exploring. So further work, um, part of this project, we're, we'll be designing an optimal monitoring strategy for the future on the Quarry Island. How to use invertebrates actually to give a snapshot of overall ecosystem health um, in the most cost-effective, efficient manner. I'm also looking at an activities island and doing a comparative study there. Uh, you'll hear later um, today about the successful mouse eradication program there. So I'm also looking at historical contemporary data on Antiquities Island and, and um, pre request for mouse eradication. And I'm continuing work looking at non-native invertebrate species interactions, how they affect the ecosystem, and developing a traits analysis of non-native species arriving to the island to try and target biosecurity on those groups. And that's it. Yes, sir. Um, so are there people that live on the island, or how are there so many different types of non-native invertebrates getting on the island? Yeah, it's a good question because uh, the island now is just a research station. It's an Antarctic Division research station, so there's usually around 12 to 30 people there over the year. But um, I guess a lot of tourist ships, and predominantly the, the species that are there arrive from a long history of sealers that live on the island. They brought a lot of things there. Um, and, but things continue to arrive through um, the Antarctic Logistics Program and tourist ships. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So the program aims were first 
uh, almost try and eradicate it from territory, but also um, to formulate other techniques. So, map of New Zealand there, for those who are not familiar, and um, Territory Island with the arrow is in the Harrogate Gulf, which is near around Auckland, which is uh, basically um, smallish island. Uh, so the treatment techniques we're looking at, um, as well as to get rid of it, were obviously to uh, be able to kill them, to also monitor uh, our progress through uh, the killing process, and also to develop surveillance techniques that we're going to put in place on this island, post eradication, and on other islands, to give us an early warning about when the ants uh, will arrive. Um, and in particular, subsequent to that, is in a, in some sort of a inventory of like of determining when you have achieved eradication. This turns out, in my case, to be quite difficult, and that's where a lot of the effort was placed uh, right at the end of the program. And from this, uh, recommendations for other island sanctuaries. Territory is an island sanctuary, we've got a variety of native species we've put there. And Argentine ants were discovered in 2000. We have a new wolf. Um, delivered and put in place through prefabricated sections, uh, right smack in the middle of where the main infestation is. That infestation, when I discovered it, was uh, very well established, as you can see. Um, there's a second infestation, which you can see right at the top there, North East Bay. And we know how that got there, because there was a dinghy parked up here full of ants and was taken up to the top there before I got involved in the program. So, around about 10 hectares um, in coverage at that time, and importantly, um, that's all they were. They were not up basically around it. Uh, buildings, the lighthouse, and where a nursery was um, for plants that were being distributed across the island. So in the first year, um, we looked at monitoring uh, lines in and out of the site to verify it's the boundary. Um, we marked off the boundary at a 20 metre buffer that. And then we treated the whole site, basically, in February 2001. Uh, with an uh, extinguished paste bait, which has uh, got fipronol in it at a very low concentration. So the whole area was covered, and the grid of coverage was uh, two by three metres, basically. We had uh, teams of uh, 14 to 16 people, which were split up in two, and those moved in unison in lines up from the coast, uh, three metres apart, putting a bait down on the ground every two metres. So that was a complete coverage, and we always designed the program to have a complete coverage in the second season as well. And we did it slightly more intensive, uh, with one metre spacing um, of baits with those people walking up the slope. So that's what the treatment bait looks like when it's on the ground. Um, there's the paste formulations. It's extruded through a corking gun um, and left on the ground. Uh, and then you see on the uh, right hand side there when some ants have got interested in it, which is the exercise. And this is a photograph of one of the teams moving up the slope. We separated the teams through a solid flagging tape so we could see it easily. Um, and bumps up and putting down the bait on the ground. <laughs> Trying as best as possible to put the bait uh, under cover so it would be protected from sunlight and would extend its life. From 2003 onwards, it was apparent that that single treatment wasn't working. We had quite significant survivors, uh, survivorship in the 2003 season. And that's when I initiated double treatment. So we would uh, put a single treatment down, wait four to six weeks for any survivors to then regroup into nests, which would be then susceptible to rebaking. Um, subsequent to 2003, um, that was very successful and became part of the standard treatment. 2004 onwards, five, etc. we were faced with very small surviving colonies, often made up of just a few nests, in some cases just a single nest. And these exhibited non invasive behaviour, which turns out to be quite critical. They weren't expanding, the nests weren't reproducing and expanding into bigger nests, multiple nests. Year by year, cases where a single nest survived just in a single nest for many years without um, going through an invasive phase and expanding. We were testing through that 2003-2005 period, um, baiting for the non-toxic vials on the ground to monitor the extent of our success. And a lot of work was done to determine what the correct spacing of that monitoring would be. Initially we thought with an invasive species we could put it out 10 metres by 10 metres, but it turns out because of the non-invasive behaviour of the survivors, we were left with a shorter distance between monitoring baits, so we settled on 3 to 5 metre spacing, which we were gridding over the entire areas which we were testing for survivors. So by 2006 I felt confident that we were getting enough, uh, getting somewhere. Uh, 2005 I didn't locate um, too many. So in 2006 I got a team to cover the entire site. It was the first time the entire site had been monitored and we came up with six nests, six columns. Uh, and in 2008 I brought the team back again 
um, to redo the entire site. So the, the exercise here was yielding the same sort of information, small colonies, um, and in between those years, I was doing my uh, monitoring of 38 key sites, basically, to, to determine survivorship. And we worked out this one where preferred sites were, um, was on the <coughs> 2009, we detected a new incursion. Uh, you can see with the arrow there, Hop Speech, on the northern end of the main infestation, um, we estimated it arrived in 2008, um, and that's based why the slides ahead of that. And we uh, covered about uh, half a head there for treatment in 2009, treated it twice, uh, six weeks apart, with that one, point, one, time, one time three metre space you can see. So, this is a story basically, graphically, of uh, the program. Up until 2006, um, there's a lot of testing of techniques going on to verify just what would work and what wouldn't work. Uh, 2006, as I said, was when the whole team um, came back and, and monitored the entire site. We found six nests. Didn't find any nests in 2007 when I was um, monitoring all the, the locations where we had survived. 2008, the team came back, just two nests were found then. New incursion 2009, as I said. And then 2010, 2011, uh, monitoring all the preferred key sites, um, just three nests were located. Now there's a history here of some nests being located one year, not being seen the next year, and then the following year a nest in more or less the same location. So clearly I still wasn't effective enough at the operation. Um, very close, but not getting rid of some of those main survivors. So in 2012 I instigated the slight variation. The critical thing was bait and longevity. Argentinians do prefer liquid or paste baits. They don't like solid baits. So we were stuck with this kind of um, format. I put toxic baits basically on the ground. Uh, that was the standard process, and those would have a maximum life of 12 hours, often only six to eight hours, before they'd be too dry and unpalatable. So I then, um, in this bottom slide there, you can see one of two pictures, um, tested putting baits inside the vials and protecting from non-target fauna to get at them. And the weight survived for five days and still palatable even after five days, um, which extended the life and enabled the bait to be available to ants for a much longer period. So I put the bait out for five days, um, put it back in again, and then uh, repeated that two weeks later. No nest has ever survived that subsequent treatment. There was major development in finally getting rid of those final nests. In the final years, um, 2014 to 16, um, I did intensive monitoring of all, as I said, all those preferred sites. Now, it turns out, um, we got to know those preferred sites very well through the program. One of them was the coastal edge, and you can see the wharf in the distance here in the upper picture. And right around this coastal edge, we've got extensive exposed rock um, where there's high temperatures and uh, short vegetation. This is very much preferred by Argentina in Auckland, New Zealand. And part of that was this part here, flax, for the antennics. Um, which is coastal and had been widely replanted on parts of the island, and it was a common plant throughout the range of the preferred sites. The ants love this, it's dry at the base, good nesting habitat, there's plenty of food on the flax, um, and access ways in terms of running along the dry flax leaves on the ground between plants. So we were targeting flax on the basis of what we had learned through that program. Um, the coastal site was where we found the last remaining ants, um, in that top picture. So that, those, that site, um, we tested, we monitored three times each of those last three seasons. To be certain that there was nothing left. Careful bait placement was actually quite critical to make sure that you tuck this away out of the sun, maximise the life of the bait. Um, and as I said, in that three year period, none were found. And so we declared uh, successful eradication in 2016 with an absence of three years. So we all know the standard protocol that you hear over and over again with just about any pest in the world. If you've eradicated something, you've got rid of it, and if you've got two years post-treatment freedom of the pest, then you walk away and say, job's done, it's eradicated. And it turns out there's a bit of evidence with Argentinians, a colleague of mine back in New Zealand uh, has done some work to uh, show that basically that's not a <coughs> right of uh, Three years um, is what his recommendation is, and certainly that's what I followed because I was so worried about these small and sort of nests that were basically surviving the operation up until that end point. So in summary, um, very intensive monitoring is required for this particular species in this sort of situation where you get survivors. You depend on the pest behaviour for the success of this. Uh, you're using a bait to attract the, the pest to, to pick it up. It's no good if that bait's not effective at doing its job. 
So you have to basically make sure that the bait's going to be there for long enough to attract the ant and therefore deliver the toxin to the nest. Um, you need to therefore maximise your bait availability. And as I've shown, there was a problem with small and uh, non-invasive nests that continue to survive up for multiple years. Five-day toxic bait and wild treatment was a success for myself in this program um, and um, could be used elsewhere. Standard eradication criteria of two years, I, I think, may not apply with the species, and you've got to be cautious with different species that you're tackling, um, that they may slip outside the general framework of it. Um, a standard, if you like. And for me, three years is recommended. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Chris? Yes. Um, have you any idea what makes small non-invasive populations turn invasive? Do you know if they do change behaviour and become invasive, or do they remain? <coughs> That's a good question. Um, the answer I don't know. <coughs> it's none of the nests that I was placed with in the latter years uh, ever became invasive. So once, um, if I found a nest. I hadn't seen for seven or eight years sort of thing. It just popped up out of nowhere. Um, and you know, it had stayed obviously a single nest for a very long time because there's no other nests around it. So for some reason, you know, out of the nests, like most ants go through a complete change of their, um, their group, their nest, usually in spring, everybody dies. And you've got new ants, new workers, new queens. It happens rejuvenation in spring. And so um, the, the invasive uh, element didn't come back during that change. So we don't know what's going on. Whether there's a, a small component of these invasive species which is in fact non-invasive and baiting like this strips out the invasive, um, all the invasive nests, which are by far the majority, and leaves a small component that not for some reason survive or are surviving the bait, and then just stay as sleep and I call them sleeper nests. But over this period of many years, these sleeper nests never any of those ever developed into their basic phase and they start replicating and spreading out. Thank you. Um, just in relation to incursions, Chris, can you explain what is being done to make sure this doesn't happen again? We get no more incursions. Well, that's right. So now we've got a surveillance plan. That territory is now under ant surveillance as part of the standard biosecurity process. Um, and I've uh, formulated uh, spacing for monitoring baits that would show up uh, an ant arrival, if you like. If I didn't detect it one year, if the ants got there just after uh, I'd done the monitoring, then they would turn up in the monitoring the next year. So the design of the surveillance and the spaces for baiting is such that if I didn't pick it up the first year, I would pick it up in the second year, and that would still be sufficient time to be able to eradicate it. It would be much more than what I was doing. What about stopping people actually spring in the first place? Oh, okay, stopping yeah. Stopping them at source. Yeah, well, that's right. So territory is an open sanctuary. Anybody can arrive on the island. Um, and that's been Persia. We had a hot speech, which was the case in point. We've had cases where nests have arrived in things like kayaks. Um, but we have an extensive public awareness program uh, to make people aware that they could carry this pest and other pests in their luggage and when they're arriving on the island. So um, we are dependent to a great extent on that public awareness campaign. But the follow-up is that on the ground, we need to do some monitoring. Um, can I just break in there? I see there are a lot more hands, but I'm very aware that Rebecca Bolton earlier on didn't get the opportunity to answer any questions. So before I, I open up to you again, Chris, is there anybody who wants to ask a question about Rebecca's work in the Galapagos? Yes. You know, you talked about the mortality of 36%. That's mm -hmm. probably the result from that. That's my question would be, do you think that's enough? Um, so that's that's that correct. Control. That's correct with mortality. So that's just mortality without successful parasitism. So, so that's forty-seven oh. percent plus the thirty-six percent. So there were very few flies that were actually developing in the lab. Um, in the wild, we see um, mortality caused by um, neuroendocrine. It varies year to year between sixty and twenty percent. But our models suggest that actually uh, quite low parasitism is enough to kind of suppress the populations of the flies and wild things to um, a level which uh, potentially protects the species. 
Okay, thanks very much for that. And I'm sorry to cut off the question. It's not just for Chrissy's talk, but for the others as well. But uh, as you'll appreciate, we are tight on time. But I think uh, that level of, of questioning and uh, latent questions as well just shows the interest uh, in the range of stimulating talks that we've heard this morning. Uh, I'd at this stage like to thank all the speakers. I'd also like to thank the folk who've been helping with the technology. We've got a couple here at the front, somebody at the back, uh, and our colleague who left earlier on. Uh, so once more, thanks very much for everyone.